I start, even though I know people are getting their food? Um, I have to get surgery, so um, I'm going to give you a, an update on collagen cross-linking. I actually um, spoke about this about two years ago in Grand Rounds. Um, cornea collagen cross-linking was approved in the U.S. by the FDA about um, two and a half, three years ago, and it's just kind of ramped up pretty slowly in terms of payer uh, reimbursement, so um, that's gotten better and better. And so the volume of procedures done in the U.S. has really skyrocketed in the last year, and uh, also in our, our uh, clinical practice here at Moran. So um, I don't have any financial disclosures, and uh, like I said, I did talk about this a couple of years ago, and there really is not a ton of new information except for just a lot more clinical experience. Um, hi, Jane Durkin. We have a guest of honor, Jane Durkin, Moran alum, alumnus. Um, Corneal collagen cross-linking, as you guys know, is mainly used for uh, corneal trans or for keratoconus, but also can be used for other ectatic conditions. And the next most common one would be post-LASIK ectasia, which fortunately is becoming less, much less common uh, with better techniques. Um, obviously, we can do cornea transplants on people with ectasia, but uh, they don't always. Uh, work out perfectly, as you could see in that bottom slide. That's not what it's supposed to look like. Um, so it would be really nice uh, knowing that keratoconus tends to be a progressive and fairly common disease to have some way of, you know, preventing it or uh, minimizing the morbidity from it. And obviously we want to identify at-risk patients. We're much better at that now with more sophisticated corneal imaging. Uh, many, mainly tomography, which many of you would know the brand names, but Pentacam would be a very common one. Galilei would be another one, which basically gives more 3D data about the cornea and its shape. But also just counseling patients, um, and certainly patients who are at risk, uh, not to rub their eyes because eye rubbing is definitely a risk factor for development of keratoconus, independent of family history and other factors. But then really the idea of this presentation is to say, well, if a person has the disease and it's progressing, is there something else we can do? And the answer is yes, we can do a variety of things to try to stabilize the disease. Uh, some of the more experienced people in the room, and I'm looking at this row right here with Dr. Hatch and colleagues, but <clears throat> you know, sometimes fitting a, a hard contact on the eye really flat fit, you know, we know that some of these keratoconus patients would almost get like an orthokeratology type, perhaps slowing of their progression, but that's not, that's not really um, predictable or reliable. Um, intracorneal rings like intacts and other rings which are available internationally definitely can provide some uh, st stabilization, but uh, cornea collagen cross-linking is probably the best way to actually stabilize the cornea, and there's a lot of evidence and more than a 10-year track record really demonstrating and proving that it is effective. It's not 100% effective, but it's very effective. So I actually use the abbreviation. You'll see the abbreviation in this uh, talk, um, KXL, just because CXL is too close to contact lens, and in charting and stuff, it just gets kind of mixed up. So the kind of the German abbreviation was K for keratoconeal cornea cross-linking. So, um, and the original um, work was done on this by Theo Seiler in Germany, and it's uh, 20 years, if you can believe that, since cross-linking using riboflavin was invented. And we use a uh, UV light source. It's in the UVA spectrum, 365 to 370 nanometers. UV light, and then just yellow solution, riboflavin. Um, sounds really simple. It is really simple. And uh, basically, the, the riboflavin absorbs the UV light, and it's not just the light energy itself, but perhaps other things uh, are happening, and no one really knows exactly 
how it all works, uh, biochemically or physically. Um, but we do know, and it just is common sense to know that um, you want to deliver the energy or the effect at the site where it's going to do the most good and also prevent um, bad side effects or consequences. And so really the cornea is where keratoconus occurs. And so we want to make sure that the light is delivered to the corneal stroma. And um, obviously one needs to standardize the amount of energy delivered and kind of the process to get consistent results and minimize side effects. So that's done just by um, monitoring or modulating the, uh, the time of exposure, the intensity of the light, and the distance to the target, as well as trying to make sure that the eye is consistently saturated with riboflavin. So removing the epithelium is kind of the traditional way of doing this, uh, where the epithelium is removed by a variety of different <clears throat> methods, scraping or many times a uh, mechanized brush, a brush called an amoils brush can be used or uh, dilute alcohol solution can be used. But that, um, as one would think just by common sense, uh, would allow better penetration of the riboflavin into the stroma. And um, obviously removing the epithelium is not without some consequences. And, one is pain, the other is loss of your natural barrier function, which could increase the risk of uh, infection from a surgical procedure. So there has been a lot of study um, in different methods of doing cornea collagen cross-linking, and certainly there's been a lot of um, work to try to make doing it with leaving the epithelium on uh, more effective. But still, most data and most practitioners uh, believe that removing the epithelium um, really results in a better long-term result. Uh, the other thing that can be monitored is the intensity of the light and the duration of the treatment. And so um, the traditional approach to collagen cross-linking, which is the, it's called the Dresden Protocol, is a 30-minute exposure to UV light, which is obviously a really long time. And um, the saturation uh, time for the uh, riboflavin is also 30 minutes, so this turns out to be like an hour and 15 minute procedure per eye. And you can't do both eyes at the same time because the light is kind of, you know, it will, it will work for one eye. So, um, but obviously if we could shorten that, that might be desirable for surgeon and patient. Um, we do know that the process works. We know that corneas are stiffened. You can see in this, um, slide here that, let's see, where was the pointer? Do you have the pointer, Austin, or is this one worked? It's not this one, is it? I don't know. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, I'm not sure where the pointer went, but um, you can kind of see in that OCT there that that's not it, is it? Uh, it's okay. I don't really have much to point out, but, oh, there it is. Um, you can see that the, um, this is just a cross-section of a cornea that's been cross-linked, and you have this, uh, we call it the demarcation line, where the, the more anterior part of the corneal collagen uh, fibers have been compacted, and um, that's something that you would like to see demonstrating that there has been a fairly deep penetration into the cornea. And um, one of the very uh, most reliable signs that this has actually worked is that you get predictable thinning of the cornea, which sounds weird because keratoconus is a disease that causes thinning. But the thinning is actually a sign that the collagen cross-linking has worked. Um, and if an OCT were done, you would want to see that line of demarcation. And it's just thought, the process of keratoconus, the basic um, defect is, is uncertain, but probably does involve some destructive enzymatic processes. And so no one really knows exactly how this works, but uh, stiffening and compacting and you know maybe killing off some fibroblasts, keratocytes, who knows. But um, anyway, the compaction does seem to stop the process fairly well. 
uh, doesn't seem to stop it if people keep rubbing their eyes. So it's important that this doesn't stop progression if people continue to rub their eyes. Um, this is just kind of restating what I already said, but um, one of the reasons that the uh, epithelium off longer 30 minute protocol seems to be more effective is that oxygen um, seems to enhance the process probably through some kind of free radical formation or other um, biochemical reaction, but no one really knows for sure exactly what's going on except that the cornea is um, compacted. So I like to think of it as like cement drying or curing. Um, we know that when we see concrete, it, you know, it kind of condenses and, and hardens. And that's kind of what happens with the cornea. Um, I believe that there is a direct injury or effect from the, the process and then probably some healing that occurs as well. And it's unknown whether that healing uh, it, or scarring, you know, they're kind of a parallel process is um, how much that contributes. But it, it makes sense that it, that is so because um, the effect seems to increase for some time after cross-linking, many patients don't achieve the full uh, thinning or compaction or even as long as 18 months, patients may be actually getting better in terms of their changes in their corneal contour. Um, there are some risks and fortunately they seem to be pretty low. Uh, I would say the main risk of the protocol that we do with epithelium off is in potential for infection just because you're taking the epithelium off, you're putting a bandage contact lens on there. But if you didn't do the right thing with the light or if you were using a light that wasn't well controlled, you could probably damage uh, the deeper structures in the eye, including the endothelium and uh, possibly even deeper structures. Um, and then, you know, it is UV light, so possibly could be some long-term consequences. Um, such as uh, ocular surface neoplasia or even uh, squamous cell uh, cancers. But um, that's unlikely as long as we uh, concentrate our uh, treatment on the non, you know, kind of stem cell type cells. And we try to avoid treating the limbus. I mean, the light is a nine millimeter diameter light. And so part of the process is not treating the limbus. So. Um, there, are, there actually have been some randomized clinical trials um, which support the efficacy of this uh, treatment to stabilize uh, keratoconus with data going out 10 or more years in some studies. And um, there, there's, uh, there are many, many, many um, uh, less good uh, papers in the literature showing efficacy. and. Um, even with it being around for more than 10 years, there's still not any real good long-term data because it's such a variable um, population that's getting this uh, with real extremes in the um, degree of keratoconus that's being treated. Uh, some people would just say, if I go to a meeting of cornea specialists, some people would say, well, just cross-link them first because, you know, if you're going to do transplant, you might as well try cross-linking. And then other people would say, well, there's no progression and there's, um, you know, there's no evidence to do it. And so I, I just feel like there's not very consistent uh, parameters for jumping in across our specialty. Hopefully we'll get better at that. The epithelia on and the... Uh, shorter duration, higher intensity UV light techniques definitely work. We know that they work. Whether they work as well as the more traditional way, most people feel like the evidence does not support the same level of efficacy, but that's still being worked on. Um, we want to do this uh, when we feel like a person has progressive keratoconus, and that's not always easy to ascertain, but sometimes it's very easy to ascertain, and I'll show you some pictures of a 12-year-old that, um, you know, I mean, literally it can change very fast over six months. But most of us know how to, you know, map our patients and refract them and look at them, and uh, generally the topographic information is what you're going to use to uh, determine whether or not a person is progressing, but also progressive myopia certainly could be a 
a, a sign of keratoconus, and certainly increase of astigmatism. Um, we really want to catch it early in the process if it is progressing because it seems like the earlier you do it, the better it works, especially in terms of improvement in uncorrected vision and uh, avoidance of even the need for contact lenses in many patients. Um, it's still a bit out there uh, in terms of doing very young pediatric patients or other high-risk patients. Um, certainly what's approved in the U.S. with a hour and 15 minute treatment is not, and, and actually pretty low reimbursement. We got a referral, um, Matt Baugh was talking to me, he said, well, they wanna send this mentally handicapped patient to the U to do cross-linking under general anesthesia in both eyes, and I'm like, that's fine, but you know, it's gonna be two and a half hours, and <laughs> you, you can just imagine. Um, so the accelerated protocols would be great for, for patients like that, where you could really get the treatment done much more quickly and do, maybe do both eyes at the same time. Um, there are also uh, a lot of um, interesting um, progress being made on combining cross-linking with vision correction, improving the shape of the eye with PRK generally, but also some with LASIK, um, either as a concurrent surgery or as a staged surgery. Um, so this is a question for the residents and the fellows or anybody who takes call at Moran Eye Center. Why is it important to avoid doing cornea transplants? Cornea transplants work great, keratoconus. The success rate is probably 98%. So who wants to answer that? Any resident who takes first call, why would you avoid doing a cornea transplant if you could? What's the number one reason? Ruptured globe, right? I mean, how many, how many people in here have seen a ruptured PK and repaired it or seen it on call or whatever? I mean, almost all the trainees, you know, most of the faculty. I mean, it's, that is what I tell my patients. That's what blinds people from cornea transplant. Now, yeah, glaucoma and complex things. And, but really, that almost immediate blindness or really traumatic loss of vision is from trauma. And so we really, and deep anterior lamellar keratoplasties can rupture horribly too. I had one recently and they're supposed to be stronger. But <clears throat> um, so that's the answer um, is, uh, and just, I think, you know, some of our, our house staff have seen this patient. I had a patient who had very advanced keratoconus in both eyes. Um, she's 23 years old. She was basically debilitated, contact lens, you know, relatively intolerant. I think 2080 best corrected in her worst eye. We did a cornea transplant on her nine days after her PK. Um, she got her eye ruptured by a friend who was, it was a laundry basket. I, I don't know how that happened, but anyway. And she lost her lens and, you know, fortunately she's doing okay. She, she was able to be repaired and she actually has pretty good vision, but um, needless to say, we did cross-linking on her less affected eye that was still a candidate for cross-linking and um, we'll see how she does. <clears throat> so we have had a lot of, of experience dating back to 2013. We were in one of the, Avidro is just the company who pushed through cross-linking in the U.S. through the FDA process. And so we were in one of their uh, trials where we looked at the accelerated treatments with the shorter duration times, which were really nice, um, as short as two, two and a half minutes, up to eight minutes. Um, we still had to put the riboflavin on. I think for that protocol, we were doing 20 minutes of riboflavin. And uh, it actually worked really well. I think all of our patients at least stabilized or improved. We did have some post-LASIK ectasia patients that didn't do as well. Um, but even those patients in general stabilized. And um, this group was biased toward more severe uh, keratoconus because if your vision was too good, you were not eligible for the study. And then we, from about 2016 on, we've been doing this post-approval kind of uh, either self-pay or insurance pay uh, cross-linking. And we have, I, you know, I bet we have 100 eyes now probably and and we've had really good results. Now, there are some people who really don't gain any additional function, but at least 
uh, many of these patients who are, you know, most of these patients, one of the great things about practicing in Utah and Salt Lake is people tend to be, um, you know, they tend to stick around so you have these longevity kind of follow-up in your patients and um, they tend to stay insured and whatever. So, I mean, I definitely have most of my patients from this trial are still seeing me and most of them are doing great. I don't think any of the keratoconus patients have gone on to transplant. And we're kind of seeing the same thing with our, our post-approval patients. I think they're, in general, doing really well. And I'm just going to put a plug in for Dr. Meyer and Dr. Petty and our other contact lens fitters for keeping them from needing transplants. That's really the other, the, the other arm of the uh, treatment is um, scleral lenses in particular are just, you know, it, you could, I could say cross-linking and scleral lenses are on equal standing for really changing the paradigm for keratoconus because so many patients can stay in contact lenses longer, avoid transplant, and be very happy. Just to be clear, Dr. Dix Petty does contact lenses. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Jeff Petty is the good-looking one. So um, I already mentioned this a little bit, but you tend to get some flattening of the cornea. Um, interestingly, the topographic or the mapping results are often not um, not coherent or you know consistent with the refractive changes. And part of that is because you're changing the relationship of the anterior and posterior curvature a little bit. So sometimes you don't see much. Um, decrease in the, uh, the steepest cornea, but you'll see a few diopters decrease in the refraction. Um, and so I'll kind of comment on that a little bit more in a minute. But um, certainly patients uh, who, some patients who cannot previously tolerate special contacts are more tolerant of them. We, we have some patients that are actually able to get back into glasses, especially the younger population, uh, they seem, it seems to have a little bit more of a reversal effect in, in early cases. Um, Post-lasic ectasia definitely, in my experience, is not nearly as effective in improving vision, but often does result in stabilization. Oh, just to, um, another comment about that. I really think part of that is because they're so broken when we find them. So please, if you see post-LASIK ectasia patients, if you just feel like, hey, this something's going wrong with this LASIK patient, send them for a pentacam, send them to us. And I feel like if we catch these patients earlier, we'll be able to help them a lot more. Um, we really haven't had any significant complications from cross-linking. You are disrupting the ocular surface. Certainly there have been um, complications, complications reported in the literature, and I'll go into that a little bit as well. But um, other than being, you know, kind of a PRK-like experience with a few days of pain and a bandage contact lens and all that, patients tend to do really well. Um, we have had some of the uh, post-LASIK ectasia patients from that original FDA protocol go on to transplant. But again, I think the selection bias of doing worse cases, it probably didn't have a whole lot of hope of really getting better. Um, so this is just a patient, and this was in the uh, FDA trial. Just kind of gives you, you know, kind of a not exceptional, just fairly common um, outcome where, of course, this patient has a lot of myopia and astigmatism, but actually had significant decrease in myopia at two years. And this is a 21-year-old guy, so he was probably really going to progress without cross-linking. So in... You know, he's my patient. He's doing great. He wears contacts most of the time, but the manifest refraction is in there to show, you know, really his myopia did decrease. If you look at the mapping, you're like, well, hmm. You know, I mean, he definitely, this is an exception because he went from 52 down to about 50, 51, but he has a, you know, pretty, quite a bit less or more effect in terms of his reduction of myopia on his, uh, comparing his keratometry to his refraction. Um, this is just another fairly uh, typical result with 
some improvement in best corrected visual acuity. And you can really even see these, this one here has a pretty significant difference in the um, anterior surface flattening uh, after treatment. And uh, that's a year out. So our post-approval experience has also been good, and I think even better because we're doing earlier cases and younger patients. Um, you know, we've kind of simplified our protocol a little bit. It's fairly user-friendly. Many patients are back in their contacts by a week or two. Um, the payment part of this is really, in my opinion, a sad commentary on our, um, our system. When we started doing cross-linking, I mean, if you think about it, it's vitamin water, right? And it's a, a black light that some of these people had back in the 60s to light up their rock and roll posters in their, in their room. But um, so when we started this process, I had to go to the technology clinic at the Moran and say, okay, we've got this thing that we want to do, and we're, it's not covered by insurance, but we want patients to pay $2,500 an eye, and you know, this is how we're going to divide up the cost. And the, the riboflavin was, um, was about 600 and something for the vials of riboflavin. And so, but shortly post-approval, the company raised their price to, it's about 2,700, Dan, what is it? Something like, something like that. I mean, it, this is like, it's just capitalism at its worst in medicine, in my opinion. Um, so much so that the company will hire a third party to, to lobby your insurance companies and your payers and your everybody to try to you know facilitate the process and it's a it's free to the surgeon in the hospital you know we're, we're jacking up our price but we're going to provide the service where you can you know get get this paid for so i just think it's ridiculous but anyway it helps my patients so i do it um this is just a post-approval patient this is a 12 year old <clears throat> um, pretty typical young patient and amazingly these 12 year olds can tolerate this um, without sedation we just do it in the outpatient clinic, uh, minor procedure room. But again, you can kind of see <clears throat> the topography it really doesn't maybe look all that much better, maybe even worse. But there's, you know, significant change. And part of that is that you can't really see it, but the cornea is thin. And then if we looked at these, uh, people who know how um, tomography of the cornea works, you'll have this best fit reference space. It, BFTEF, best fit toric elliptical front. So that's going to give you a radius of curvature of the comparison surface that it's comparing to. And so that will actually change when you do cross-linking. The comparison surface will change, generally flattening. And that's one of the reasons the maps are not as impressive, but overall the cornea is flattening. And that's why you get reduced myopia and better vision. And the astigmatic effect is definitely more variable and probably less good, and that's one of the reasons why it's good to catch these patients early. <clears throat> um, this is a fellow eye of that other patient, and it just kind of shows, as we were waiting for the first eye to heal and kind of deciding whether the 12 or 13-year-old patient needed the second eye done, he had pretty significant progression, including notable steepening of the posterior cornea comparatively. So um, young people with keratoconus do tend to progress pretty fast. Um, so probably there's a, a lot of people, there are a lot of people who won't benefit or maybe don't need it or you're not sure if you're going to help them or not because the natural course of the disease is different as one gets older. But um, too old, too thin, too diabetic or too much scarring or going to be contact lens dependent and maybe need a transplant anyway. So I feel like there are patients where uh, generally around 50, 50 or mid 50s is where I stop offering cross-linking to patients. But we all know those of us who take care of it, it's not the same for every person. And some people do progress in mid midlife uh, significantly. And certainly if they're progressing and if they're not too far gone, cross-linking makes sense. Um, I think defining the goal is really important. Many of these patients may not understand that the goal is to stop progression and uh, still, still be contact lens dependent. But as long as that's established, patients are very accepting and very appreciative. And I already talked a little bit about this. So uh, cross-linking is kind of like the EpiPen of ophthalmology. 
But I have issues with lots of other things in ophthalmology, like things like omidria, which is ketorolac and phenylephrine, which is, I don't know how much that costs, Dan, but, you know. 140 per vial. Yeah. And I don't think the drops cost that much, but anyway. So I don't, I'm not going to go into all that. But um, informed consent is really important. It gets a little tricky when you're operating on minors. So you just, I'm really cautious to make sure I meet with the parents and the patient at least twice and go over everything. Um, that's kind of obvious. Our procedure, this just describes it. I'll kind of cruise through this because we have other presenters. But it's, it's done with topical anesthetic, um, 30 minutes of soaking it with uh, riboflavin after the epithelium is removed. The surgeon actually removes the epithelium, kind of prepares the eye. Then we have a technician put the drops in. We take the lid speculum out when the drops are be being put in, and then we have to put the lid speculum back in for 30 minutes during the UV exposure. Um, yeah, usually patients are out of a bandaged contact lens by about a week. With the epithelium, sometimes will heal as quickly as a couple of days in these patients. Um, you see whitening of the stroma early on, and then um, that's kind of a desirable endpoint. It, it looks a little bit like the the frozen chicken that you put in the microwave, and it, the edges get a little bit thawed when you, or get a little bit slightly blanched when you put it on the defrost setting. And it's a little scary. The first few patients, you look at it, and you're like, oh my gosh. But even by the next day, they look pretty good. And then the thinning is really, I think, the best indicator that it really works, thinning on topogra or tomography. Um, I already kind of addressed this a little bit, but people work at different ways to try to get the epithelium to penetrate if one is leaving the epithelium on, including trying to get the uh, cell membranes to break down a little bit with somewhat toxic drops or substances using hypotonic solutions and even applying electrical current. Um, the, I think the other part of the trying to make it more efficient makes sense. If you just use brighter light and shorter time to deliver the same energy, then maybe it's going to work the same. Um, sterile keratitis is kind of an interesting thing that we've never seen, but um, there was a big series of 700 and some eyes in the uh, Middle East in, Be in Lebanon, I think, where they found some sterile keratitis. And I actually read that paper and I was like, or it was actually called P, a late onset PUK, but I, I don't know. I, I just haven't really heard about that in the U.S., so I'm not quite sure what that means. But certainly infection's a possibility, and there have been a few infections reported in these patients, none in our center, fortunately. Um, we have alternative treatments. We can't forget about those. Uh, intacts actually work pretty well, but I think they're less predictable. But we, we have some patients who have had um, real stabilization of their uh, keratoconus with uh, intrastromal corneal rings, and Intax is the most common brand used in the U.S. Um, I'm going to um, just briefly, briefly touch on a couple other things here. I want to give our fellows plenty of time, but um, people wonder about other uses for cross-linking. Um, this, this study came up where um, uh, it, was, it was in Europe, I can't remember exactly where, but they just took these keratoconus suspect patients and just did PRK on them, and, and, and they were older patients, thinking that, well, probably their pre-keratoconus is stable, and they actually did very well. So, you know, that's maybe a testament to say, well, you know, maybe, maybe we shouldn't be cross-linking older patients. Um, I, I think the jury is still out on that. Um, uh, infectious keratitis, it sounds like it would be a great use, but part of the problem is that the, um, the light doesn't really penetrate deep enough for many really severe corneal infections, but it has more efficacy in bacterial infections. Um, might make a lot of sense in a really uh, kind of underserved, um, you know, kind of setting where People may not come back, and you just want to do what you can to try to debulk their infection. But um, one of the infections that we would love to use it for, if possible, would be acanthamoeba. But um, superficial acanthamoeba is actually pretty easy to cure with drugs and scraping and debridement and all the things. We try to identify that infection early. Once it's deep, more deeply uh, established, cross-linking really has not been shown to be very effective. Um, 
and similarly with fungal infections, which also might be logically uh, tried, you know, a, a, a possibility to treat because they're so hard to cure sometimes. But it really, it's a lack of penetration in our in our setting. It's just not practical. I mean, the drug's too expensive. It just you know, we haven't used it for infectious keratitis. Um, it doesn't work for radial keratotomy. I think that's pretty established. Uh, some people say, well, it decreases the diurnal fluctuation a little bit, but um, there are some case reports, but also a lot of anecdotal evidence from practitioners. It really does not work to help radial keratotomy patients. Um, I would like to try it on Tarion's marginal degeneration. So if you have a person with active Tarion, send them to us and we'll try to do cross-linking on them. So I think it would work for that. Um, I'm gonna just go on here. So what about doing it in normalized? Combining cross-linking with uh, high myopia LASIK has actually been shown to be uh, very effective. Combining it with PRK has been shown to be also effective, uh, more effective if it's staged. Uh, there are a couple papers out on this, meaning do the cross-linking first, wait six months, then do the PRK. That makes sense because I've already told you that you know things change a little bit after cross-linking. Interestingly, with the LASIK patients, um, it was a there was a big study in. Well, I'll just mention. Usually, they're not putting quite as much energy into these patients who get combined uh, cross-linking with LASIK or PRK. Three three joules as opposed to the 5.4. This LASIK study by Kenilopoulos, who's a U.S. guy, but did this study in Greece, and they actually had really good results. And so I think they're really, I mean, it's not um, far-fetched to do a thin flap LASIK on a keratoconus kind of suspect or at-risk patient if you cross-link. It definitely had very good results in this uh, study. Most of us would do PRK. So it's effective, um, it's available. Please try to identify uh, keratoconus early in your young patients, send them to us. We want to see these people. We are getting insurance to pay for it reasonably well. We're not losing money, not really a money maker for Moran, but we're not losing money. And we feel like it's really an important, almost public health kind of thing to try to prevent keratoconus from getting worse. You see that one young person who goes blind from their trauma after their PK, and that's all you need to see. You're motivated to do cross-linking. Um, body of evidence supports the traditional Dresden protocol. Um, I think along with a lot of other really hard questions for our new generation of doctors on you know, how to pay for health care, this is just a good example of why you all need to get involved and try to apply some common sense to the medical industrial complex if you can. And uh, if you have any really brief questions, I'll take those. This is from my hike to King's Peak two weeks ago. Yeah, Roger. Just to kind of laser scrape, you mean? or? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a really interesting area and we're trying to put, I mean, it, combining, um, Transepithelial PRK and cross-linking makes a lot of sense because the epithelium acts like a, you know, a masking agent. And it, we know in keratoconus, if there's a cone and a bulge inferiorly, the epithelium is going to be thinner over that. So actually, if you do a transepithelial PRK plus cross-linking, that makes a lot of sense. We've, we're trying. We've been trying to get the software for the kind of the laser scrape for our Allegretto for years, and it's just not approved in the U.S. But uh, people are starting to do that, and I think we'll just start doing it. We'll we'll just use we'll double card and figure out a way to do it. But that that's a good point. That would be a good way to do it. Anything else?